has been removed from the agenda, Executive Regulation 4-15 AM. It's been sent back to the Fed Committee for further work. Now, um, we invited, relevant to the adoption of the uh, Energy Code, um, I had some questions in the Fed Committee regarding the status of the International Green Construction Code. And um, I know that the guests that I invited are here because I see them. We had this agenda item scheduled at 10.15. Ms. Schwartz-Jones, are we prepared now to get into a discussion of the International Green Construction uh, Code? Good morning, sir. We'd be happy to. Thank okay, you. great. So um, if Mr. Ralph Bennett and Mr. Daniela Sheveko would also join us. Um, what I wanted to do, I, I don't think this will take too long. I wanted to give an opportunity both to the department and to community advocates uh, from whom I've been hearing over some period of time just to give the full council a sense of where we stand on the issue of green buildings. The council uh, may recall that in 2006, the county council enacted what was at that time the strongest green buildings requirement in the United States, but in the intervening years, there's been a cascading of knowledge. Uh, architects now are routinely um, lead uh, uh, qualified. That was not the case back in 2006. Um, the ability to bring these buildings online and, frankly, market expectations of having green buildings is substantially advanced beyond where uh, the situation was in 2006. Both Mr. Berliner and I have sought to modernize the legislation, but we were told, well, no, hold off. We're not going to uh, move in the direction of strengthening lead requirements because we're working on the International Green Construction Code. But when um, Executive Regulation 4-15 AM, which we're not now acting on this morning, came before the Fed Committee. Um, I asked what's the status of the Green Construction Code and I'm still a little perplexed and confused. I'm still not clear on what the Executive Branch's plans are in that regard and, and uh, knowing of the T&E Committee's strong interest in this matter, the Fed Committee's strong interest in this matter and I think all Council members' interest. Um, and, and in particular, the strong interest of community members who are here who have been communicating with me over some years on this topic, I thought it would be worthwhile to give the full council a short update on what we're doing with respect to green buildings, a topic that Montgomery County has pioneered in the past, but which I'm concerned we're now uh, falling behind on. So um, we will have Ms. Jones uh, make a presentation on behalf of the department. Um, I know Mr. Mansouri, I, I don't know this gentleman. Do you want to introduce yourself, sir? Well, actually, let's, let's do this. Let's uh, start from left to right. Let's have each of our guests introduce themselves for the record. We'll then call on Ms. Jones, and I will interact with Ms. Jones as to who will speak next. But anyone on this day, uh, on this panel, who wants to speak will be given the opportunity to do so. So right now, we're just introducing ourselves. Mr. Shaveko. Daniela Shaveko with the Montgomery County Civic Federation and former uh, co-chair of the county's official Water Quality Advisory Group. Uh, good morning, uh, Diane Schwartz-Jones, Director of the Department of Permitting Services. Good morning, Hadi Mansouri, Department of Permitting Services. Good morning, Mark Nauman, Senior Specialist with DPS. Good morning, Ralph Bennett, uh, architect in Silver Spring, and I'm representing the Potomac Valley Chapter of the American Institute of Architects. Thank you all very much for being here. Ms. Jones, where do we stand on green buildings? Okay, thank you, Mr. Leventhal. Uh, first of all, I want to begin by pointing out that uh, the county executive, uh, Ike Leggett, and uh, the department all support the objectives of the green building um, code, the IGCC. Uh, we've done a lot of work on it, and I wanted, we've got a short PowerPoint presentation to give you some information with it. Um, one, I wanted to, to start out by explaining that the International Green Construction Code is, uh, is an umbrella code. It was adopted by, it, it's a model umbrella code. It was adopted by um, the state of Maryland uh, several years ago as a voluntary compliance pathway. It has a lot of information in it. It ranges from things that happen within the building to things that happen on site, to water usage, to landscaping to, um, to uh, recycling and waste reduction, to mitigation of heat island impacts and so forth. Um, we, we have been looking at this. Um, we, we do have, as you know, an existing green building law, which does mandate a level of lead for buildings that exceed 10,000 square feet. 
Um, we have not gotten a lot of buildings uh, in compliance as a result of this law. We've, uh, this law has resulted in 141 projects, of which 51 have actually been certified since 2008. We actually like the International Green Construction Code because it uh, mandates a baseline of performance that we think is important. It's easier for us to measure it. It makes certain that all buildings will perform at a certain level. Um, that said, it applies to an awful lot, and there are many different perspectives on this, and we wanted to do outreach and work with the public to ensure that everybody would understand what was in the code and have an opportunity to comment on what should be um, brought forward. As a result of that, we had numerous public meetings. We maintained a public record mm -hmm. of it. I did notice that um, Mr. Bennett has indicated that our, um, the information was no longer up on our website. I was surprised to see that, but we'll look at that because uh, we really don't have a reason to take it down because we're, our work is not finished. So what will, whoops, no, no, please go back. What will the IGCC do? Um, we have been discussing it in order to apply it to all new commercial construction. Um, new construction and additions, not, not renovations, but new building construction uh, for commercial, which would include multifamily buildings. Um, it would be whether we are looking at it um, to apply to all construction of any size as well, so that we would begin to capture the 10,000 square feet um, and smaller buildings. The IGCC will create a better energy performance with the built environment. Um, it will create, as I indicated, a measurable baseline. Um, it will provide greater consistency as to new construction, new building performance, and we think it will provide greater clarity by having it adopted. Um, next slide, please. So as we worked with the public and had many outreach sessions, we came up with a proposal. Uh, one of the things, and I'm going to focus you on the right hand, what would be my right hand side of this slide to begin with, is that we're also cognizant of our, our very important need to streamline the overall entitlement process. And one of the things that can really upset the streamlining of the entitlement process is having um, confusing confusion between which authority is responsible for what. So we w did want to, in working with this, and we, 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 brought, we made sure that WSSC and Park and Planning, um, DEP, our, our colleagues, and the public, the civics, and the building industry were all included in our discussions. But we want to make sure that we don't get involved um, mandating in areas that we don't have jurisdiction or control over, and that we, um, we leave those to other people's wheelhouses. And yet, if somebody wanted to do more than what is required by these other authorities and can show us that they're doing more, we wanted that to be available as options as well. So for example, site plans deal with landscaping on site. We don't really mandate you have to do this or that for landscaping, but as part of a site plan and almost with the new zoning rewrite, virtually all new projects, um, the vast majority of them will have a site plan. So park and planning will um, deal with it in, in that vein to begin with. And we don't want somebody to go through the, the park and planning process only to come to us and then have to start over again because we're telling them they have to do something that is different than what was in the site plan. By the same token, um, things involving the water reclamation, that's, that falls within WSSC's wheelhouse. If they can show us that WSSC has certain requirements and they've exceeded them, we've moved that to an option, so that can be one of the options that I'm about to discuss with you. So what we did is we focused on three main areas that we really can capture and have meaningful input into. Um, that would The first would be to reduce the overall energy consumption within the building. Um, reduce, in other words, um, how the building will perform. Will the building, the, the overall target being to reduce the energy consumption of that building by approximately 10% over the 2012 baseline. We also wanted to ensure that um, we could capture uh, a plan for recycling so that waste would either be reduced or diverted through the demolition and the construction process. And then also the mitigation and the minimization of the heat island um, effect. And we were s starting at 40% um, of the hardscape. We also had indicated that we were going to require as part of the submission package that as we intend, at least in our current thinking um, to have moved that some of the things that others can require, we would move forward to options. Not that, that the 
the minimum requirement would be would be satisfaction of selecting an option, but that they show how they're going to exceed what would otherwise be required. And if it's exceeding, then that could be an acceptable um, option pathway. In recent discussions, the, the question um, actually with Mr. Um, Shevenko, did I say it correctly? Uh, he's, he asked us about whether or not we could increase the number of options that we may require. And um, we think that that is a reasonable area for discussion and uh, we're going to look at that. So that's how we were looking at, um, that's how we're currently looking at the IGCC proposal. We actually even drafted the regulations, and as you know, when we draft regulations, we also look at the um, fiscal and economic impacts. And so in order to do that, um, we needed to uh, have some work done on that. Next slide, please. Before I go to that, though, this slide b basically talks about the benefits. Why would we do the um, IGCC? Well, we have a climate protection plan. The climate protection plan recognizes the fact that buildings are large energy consumers. And for us to be sustainable for our children, our children's children, the built environment has to have less of a, a, a drain on, on the environment. And so that's the objective of the IGCC. That's where we want to go. Um, this current iteration, the 2012 iteration of the IGCC, uh, has specific benefits. Um, you can see it on this slide. I, 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 you know, obviously, it's reducing the um, energy usage, reducing carbon emissions, um, encouraging uh, material reuse and recycling, improving water quality, et cetera. Uh, overall, we think it is very important to do this, and we do think that um, in the end analysis that the buildings and the owners of the buildings will actually see both reduced um, maintenance and energy costs, and also we think improved value. Um, the improved value piece is a little bit difficult to show, but we can show other things. Next slide, please. So we looked at, we, we, in order to get our heads around, and, and this actually and took some time to do this, to, to get our heads around what is the economic impact of doing this, we, um, we used uh, a contractor who, uh, of, that DGS has under contract. Initially, that contractor was going to look at both public and private buildings to understand how the application of the IGCC as we were proposing it would impact the costs and the, um, the avoided costs of the um, building going forward. They came to the conclusion quickly that they really had the data to deal with the public buildings and not to deal with the private buildings. So we then engaged um, two different players, if you will, two different um, organizations from the private sector uh, who are familiar with these topics. Um, I'm going to, the, the Grimm and Parker study for the public buildings really found that the, the IGCC, as we are proposing, it really is not going to have much of a cost, added cost impact on the public buildings. It will have beneficial um, impacts and avoided costs as well and in the carbon um, uh, reduction that we were aiming for. Next slide, please. So the, the two private entities that we uh, dealt with was uh, Theron Waddell, uh, Dan Coffey, who is very active in the U.S. Green Building Council. I know he's a colleague of Mr. Bennett's. Um, he agreed to do um, some case studies for us to apply the IGCC, particularly to the smaller buildings. We wanted to understand what is this going to mean for the building industry um, that will have to comply with this. Um, and particularly, you know, these smaller buildings that haven't had to comply uh, prior to this time. So he did some studies. He did a one-story office building of 9,000 square feet. He did a three-story office building of 19,000 square feet. And then he did a daycare as well. And I'm going to, if we can, I want to come back to this slide because I want to go to the next slide as well. Because I want, there, there's some, there's a point that I want to make here relating these two together. Um, JBG uh, has been fairly progressive in many of its buildings. Uh, they, they do embrace the approach to, to lead, and I had spoken with, we spoke with them and asked them, would you please do a study on some of the buildings that you're doing right now and let us know what would be the differences. You're already doing certain things to achieve um, a, a better energy sustainability, so if we were to mandate the IGCC, what would be the cost impacts of doing that on a square foot basis? And so they actually looked at it and they compared it to the various, um, at the time, 
the um, Leeds version three was what was in place, the lead version four was not yet in place, and they, they did an analysis of this. As you can see, 